The history of Indians in various countries around the world has by no means been uniform. In some countries, Indians have enjoyed an income or occupational level above that of the majority population. This has been true not only in such African nations as Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, but also in such disparate societies as Malaysia, Fiji, and the United States. This has not been the case, however, in Guyana, where the local African-American population has historically been economically somewhat ahead of the Indians, though that was changing by 1967. While the Indians of South Africa have been economically ahead of the black majority there, they have been well behind the long-dominant white minority. Partly, these different fates of Indians in different countries reflect conditions and policies in the countries themselves, quite clearly in South Africa, for example, or in the degree of urbanization of the Indians, as in Guyana, where rural concentration has obvious negative implications for money income and urban occupational status. By and large, however, the economic positions of Indians abroad reflected the economic positions of the numerous divisions of the Indian people in India itself. The striking business success of the Gujaratis has been apparent in Bombay or in East Africa, and Gujaratis have outpaced other Indians economically as businessmen in Guyana, Fiji, and South Africa. Chetyars have likewise extended their prominent role as bankers, moneylenders, and traders from southern India and Ceylon to Burma, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Mauritius. The Tamils, who have dominated Indian migration to the plantations of Sri Lanka and Malaysia, have no such record of entrepreneurial success in those countries, but neither do they match the Gujaratis or the Chetyars in this respect in India itself. The economically superior position of the Indians in Singapore, as compared to Indians on the Malay Peninsula, goes back to colonial times and likewise reflects differences that have long existed between the same groups in India. Indians in Guyana are products of a poverty-stricken region of northeast India and have no such pattern of striking economic success abroad as the commercial Gujaratis or the money-lending Chetyars. In short, Indians in some countries have been middlemen minorities, and in others not. Where they have been businessmen, their commercial success has to varying degrees tended to be reflected in rising levels of education over time and in a movement into the professions, much in the pattern of the overseas Chinese and the Jews. Also, like these other middleman minorities, Indians in these roles have tended to keep a low political profile. Few have pursued political careers overseas, and politics has had little or nothing to do with their rise to affluence in foreign lands. Often politics has been an obstacle to that rise, and, especially in post-colonial times in Africa and Asia, politics has been a threat to positions already achieved in the economy. Idi Amin's brutal expulsions of 50,000 Indians and Pakistanis from Uganda was the worst and most dramatic example of hostile political processes at work, more subtly and insidiously, in much of post-colonial Africa, in Burma, and to a lesser extent in Malaysia and Fiji. The vicissitudes of the overseas Indians also follow a pattern of long-standing in the history of the overseas Chinese, the Jews, the Armenians, the Igbos of Nigeria, the Lebanese in West Africa, and other middleman minorities. Despite many tragedies and injustices, Overseas Indians seem to have suffered less severely than other leading middleman minorities, whether due to historical happenstances or to differences in the behavior of the Indians themselves. However, like the overseas Chinese and the Jews, overseas Indians have generally held themselves separate and aloof from the surrounding populations. Indians have in fact tended to be much more resistant to intermarriage with the surrounding population than the overseas Chinese. The oft-repeated claim that hostility to Jews, Chinese, or other middleman minorities is due to their clannishness is belied by the fact that even greater clannishness among the overseas Indians seems not to have provoked as much hostility as the Jews, Chinese, and others have faced. Moreover, the deliberate decision of the Aga Khan to have his Ismaili followers in Africa adopt the language and culture of the surrounding society and to seek local citizenship did not spare the Ismailis the same fate as other overseas Indians in Africa. Even among those overseas Indians who were not middleman minorities, a certain tenacity, persistence, and frugality have been observed, 
as among other peoples from lands where survival has historically been difficult, the Scots or the Japanese, for example. Transplanted to countries where subsistence is more easily obtained, such as Fiji or Malaysia, these Indians have eventually surpassed those indigenous to the country and whose way of life evolved under its more favorable conditions. That Indians have prospered in other countries around the world, while India itself has been poverty-stricken, remains a paradox, even after allowance for the fact that many of these prosperous Indian groups are also prosperous at home. In colonial East Africa, for example, Indians did not simply transfer their wealth to those countries, but usually began at quite modest and even precarious economic levels, from which they rose to affluence and sometimes riches. The more modest economic achievements of Indians in Guyana nevertheless represent a substantial rise from their original status as plantation laborers treated little better than slaves. Whether the pattern of prosperity abroad and poverty at home reflects simply selective migration or reflects as well barriers to economic development within Indian society is a question of more than theoretical interest, and in fact a question of momentous practical implications. What is known is that the overseas Indians working in professional, technical, managerial, and administrative occupations around the world in 1981 added up to more than a quarter of a million people. Because of high levels of unemployment among people in such occupations in India, it is not clear that their skills and talents would have been put to use had they remained at home. Both India's doctors and engineers seek employment overseas in substantial numbers. Official efforts to get Indians to return from overseas to help develop their homeland have had meager results, despite preferential treatment of their investments relative to the treatment of investment by other non-citizens or by citizens living in India. However, remittances from overseas Indians, more than $5 billion in 1981, amounted to more than all the foreign aid used by India that year. The overseas Indians have thus made a significant contribution to their country of origin, even without being there personally. In many cases, they have made even more of a contribution to the development of the countries to which they migrated.